QSO Today, episode 458, Ulrich Rohde, and 1UL. This episode of QSO Today is listener-sponsored. Only you can keep the QSO Today podcast coming to you every weekend since 2014. Please become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the Sponsor banner on the show notes page or at the top of the QSOToday.com webpage. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, amateur call sign 4Z1UG, where I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio, do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates through in-depth interviews just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is no longer. It has morphed into the QSO Today Academy, a weekend event focused on the best ham radio presentations on the Internet and coming the weekend of September 9th and 10th. There is a call for speaker presentations and any vendors who want to showcase their products in helpful and constructive presentations. Please watch for the emails in your email box this week to participate. Listener sponsors, both monthly and annually, automatically qualify for access to the QSO Today Academy and the September event. Another good reason to become a listener sponsor, monthly or annually. Last week I told you that my wife Karen was going through a health crisis that perhaps many of us of retirement age go through. This caused some time issues for me, resulting in my reprising some past episode. Thanks God she's back to normal from a cocktail of medications that have put everything back in place. I appreciate your messages and prayers. As a result, we were able to spend a week in a lot, Israel's southernmost port city, on the Red Sea, where we rested red books and did a bit of scuba diving. There's an interesting parallel to scuba diving and ham radio that I noticed this week. I have the Patty open water or technician class of scuba diving with lots of dives in my logbook. I've never felt the need to upgrade. I like to follow the dive master at level, mastering buoyancy and just floating along. Very relaxing and I love it. I was paired in two dives this week with a buddy who was general class level or advanced paddy dive level, but with very few dives in their logbooks. I discovered that both did not have enough experience to be enjoyable dive buddies, floating to the surface, not able to keep their equipment under control under the water. This might make the argument that in ham radio, advancing to general, then extra, without experience, perhaps may cause the ham to miss the enjoyment of finding a single place and mastering it. In scuba diving, advanced divers can go deeper into the water, even exploring wrecks and underwater grottos. However, While they have the ticket to go, their lack of experience makes this a very dangerous activity. Getting the experience even at the technician level is good experience. I've had a hard time deciding which of my podcast interviews is my favorite. I know that my podcast episodes are like my grandchildren. I love them all and for different reasons. So choosing one to replay is always hard for me because I can choose all of them. The earliest podcasts that I reprise take hours to redo because I will literally go back and re-record all of my questions exactly as I asked them, but with better audio quality. This, t- this week, I decided to save myself the effort because I thought I would just choose one that was interesting that already had high-quality audio. Dr. Ulrich Rohde, N1UL, is a trailblazer in the world of RF oscillator and receiver design. Throughout the past four decades, N1UL has penned more than 60 articles for esteemed publications like QST and QEX magazines. Not only that, but he also has contributed to the field through his books, academic papers, and various articles. Dr. Rohde continues to impact on his family business, the Munich-based Roden Schwartz Test Equipment Company, as well as on amateur radio manufacturers such as ICOM, where he played a key role in the design of the IC7850. Ulrich Rohde was featured in this month's QST magazine, and N1UL is my QSO today. N1UL, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Ulrich? Yes, I'm fully here. Great, Ulrich. Thanks for joining me at, at the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? I think my first interest uh, in ham radio started because my father 
had a ham radio license. Uh, his call sign was DJ5 London Radio. <clears throat> At the time, he drove an American car with a big whip antenna, a Collins KWM2 built in. Uh, from today's point of view, somewhat of a complicated issue. And uh, so I kind of looking at the operation and see this, I became curious. I played a little bit with the crystal detectors to hear the local AM station, but I kind of followed my father's activity. So did he guide you in your education towards amateur radio and getting your first license? No. No, he didn't need to because uh, I was curious what this all meant. And uh, so I yeah, picked up the literature, whatever was available in 1956. I don't remember all the details, but uh, ultimately I found myself at the German post office uh, applying for applying for the test and for a license. And so your first license in 1956, 1957? 56, yeah, correct. And what was your first call sign? Uh, first call sign was DJ2LRX with an X at the end. Was that a, a regular license, or did they have something similar to the American Novice license in Germany? Yeah, this was similar like the Novice. Uh, this was a uh, VHF, UHF uh, license, because the first thing I did, I flunked the Morse code. And so what happened after that? Well, for a long time, I stayed uh, on uh, short uh, on the VHF, UHF, and then ultimately I got angry at myself and upgraded to a regular Class A license, equivalent to the German I took the American extra class license, and when I moved to America, I had to retake all the license again up to extra class license. Uh, with the code? Everything, yeah. Can we go back to your father for just a second? Uh, I saw a slide in a presentation where you were mentioned um, that you might be related to the Roden Schwartz Test Equipment Company. Is that your family? Yes. So your father, the reason he drove an American car and had a Collins KWM2, was he the founder of Roden Schwartz? Yes, together with Dr. Schwartz, the two of us. Wow. Well, that's pretty amazing. Uh, for those of us who love test equipment, we, we know Roden Schwartz pretty well. So you actually had um, quite a, a technical tailwind, I would guess, um, in, in your life. Did, um, did ham radio then, at that point, then play a, a, a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? Uh, initially not. No, it was just uh, physics, and uh, I liked the hobby. I liked to be able to talk to people. Uh, I had a few days to go to get the high school diploma, so uh, not really. It was too early. It was too early. So you actually took your degree then in physics? High school diploma uh, was a few years later. So at the moment, I was just enjoying the ability to talk to people in Europe. I really didn't care too much about the inner workings of the radio. I liked the uh, communication. In those days, in the, in the late 50s, you were operating on VHF and UHF, as you'd said earlier. What modes were you operating uh, in VHF and UHF? Uh, we had uh, amplitude modulation at the time. FM, FM and repeaters came much later. And uh, for a while, I had a Geloso American uh, two-meter single sideband radio in my car. Very few had it. It was funny uh, to drive over the mountains, and uh, I, I liked the single sideband operator in the car. Of course, today you don't get anybody anymore. So you were operating two-meter AM from your car. And single sideband. And single sideband. Well, that's pretty cool. And were you using like a quarter wave antenna or something like that on the roof? I see, I guess, yeah. Uh, I forgot it, but it was, probably had to be a quarter wave like the car, yeah. Well, when I think about it, I mean, it's actually uh, kind of amazing when, you're, when you think about um, operating two meters without repeaters in the countryside. Uh, that, that meant that there was actually people to talk to. And uh, the, the band, was it, was it popular in those days? Well, Germany is very hilly. Uh, so there were many uh, highly elevated places, and a lot of people were living there, and uh, they had uh, big antennas. And yes, uh, between the Swiss Alps, the Austrian Alps, and the Bavarian Alps, uh, there was enough activity. You could, uh, 400 miles and so, radius, uh, get contacts from the highway and so on, in two meters single side. Are you active now on the air? Very much, yeah. How did that evolve? I mean, you, you came to America in what year and went through and retested for all the licenses. When did you come to America? Well, I moved to America in 1974. And the very moment you get an American passport, you lose all your visitors' privileges. So I had no choice but to retake all the tests. My first American call sign was KA2WEU, pretty lengthy. And uh, then a friend of mine gave me so much headache because the call sign was so long. So I applied for a vanity call sign in Monuel. And uh, the Morse code, uh, I flunked in one week the test three times. 
uh, <laughs> the final day I finally passed, it was nine out of ten correct. And uh, in the room next door, they were singing Christmas calls, full blast, and I had my ears full with the most code and the singing, and then the table collapsed, and I was writing the letters on a piece of paper in the air, and I got so stressed, I ultimately decided not to drive home, but to the airport. I don't know what, why I drove to the airport, but I drove to the airport after I passed the test. So I left America? No, I just went to the airport, and then I found... Oh, okay. And I didn't know why... I then I realized I went to the airport and I turned around. I had no idea why I did it when I went to the airport. <laughs> it was funny. I remember this. So after your your high school, where did you study? And what did you study? I studied uh, yeah, essentially what you would call radio communication in Munich and in Darmstadt. Uh, Munich is a very crowded place. And uh, so I went to this much smaller place uh, in Darmstadt. It's uh, north of, northern of Munich, yeah. And you attained bachelor's and master's degrees and equivalents. Uh, you, you have a PhD as well. All of that from um, from Germany? Yeah, I have uh, two PhDs from uh, Germany, American master's degree. I have a mixture of uh, different things and some are honorary degrees and some are what you call earned degrees. I have a mixture of these things. Yeah, that's correct. Did you pursue from the very beginning uh, a career in radio communications? Yeah. Yeah, I think this uh, communication is, is probably the closest to uh, that because Radio communication at the time uh, meant all the things we split today. I mean, everything what you can do with a cell phone uh, would fall at those days on the radio. Can you speak about your early work in radio communications? Well, I think one of the, the first uh, almost negative experience was uh, I worked for uh, AEG Telefunk in, in Germany. At the time, the military communication was forbidden to be done in Berlin because of the Soviet, English, French, and German situation there. And uh, I was in charge of man packs and similar things. And I had a house pretty high in 19 floors, and uh, I couldn't hear the Canadian uh, time signal because the receiver was so lousy. So it took a while before I understood that pre-amplifiers are not what you want, and firsthand, besides mathematics, I realized that the inter intermodulation distortion uh, can kill you and what sideband is. There's a difference whether you read these things in a textbook or whether they get you in trouble. Uh, so this was most exciting for me in real time to see what the consequences were, and I remember that uh, I gave away about a hundred or so AGC pin diode attenuators for the Yesu FT101. Uh, which you could put in the front end, and then this thing became infinitely better because rather than have a pre-amplifier there, it had an attenuator which adjusted to the signals and noise ratios you needed, and all of a sudden these radios were very powerful. Yeah, the concept of dynamic range uh, really wasn't understood in these days. But, uh, that's the thing uh, I came up with. But, uh, I probably built the first uh, fully solid-state man pack with an automatic antenna tune and everything. It, uh, this was the result of being snowed in uh, on a ski adventure in Italy. We had so much snow, nothing to eat, a few candles and nothing to do. So a group of friends and my we said, what do we do? So we came up with a concept of a man pack uh, as a competition to the PRC 104. Really? And what was this man pack? This was made by Telefunken. AG Telefunken, yeah, that's correct. What was the model number of this man pack? I mean, we may have some listeners who are military man pack collectors. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fully with you. I just have to find it. While you're looking it up, you were very hands-on then in terms of this uh, of this equipment. You actually took it home to your 19th floor apartment and, and tried it out rather than stay in the lab with it. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, here it comes. It's called an AEG 6861-12MOD. And uh, you can find the details on www.kpjung.ee slash e underscore aeg dot htm. Yeah, that's the man pack. Uh, in this, it shows also the picture of us. Uh, we invented this. This, as I said, was the world's first fully automatic antenna tuner, 20 watt all mode single sideband, and had uh, a um, interesting voice processor uh, and uh, yeah this was the, really much better than the PSC 104 about what year was this this was in the in the late 60s yeah 68 yeah you stayed then with um, AG Telefunken for a number of years and then you came here yeah I, uh, I was kind of forced to go to America before my of course my father found out 
that the people who ran the uh, American RNS division uh, were, were about to retire. And so with uh, not much notice, my father said, go and fix it. So that's what I did. I went and fixed it. And never came back. I did not come back. First of all, America is the land at the time specifically of many opportunities. And uh, in Germany, if you want to go anywhere, you have to have a lot of connections. You have to have the right age and all the right credentials. And if you have a very famous father, the father's in the way because everybody measures you against your father, but not yourself. You kind of disappear. And I didn't like this, so I ran away. And I was happy to go. And uh, then when the RNS operation uh, grew in size, uh, I joined uh, the RCA Corporation in Camden. Now, first, I ran my father's company in America, the Roland Schwartz Corporation, yeah, in Clifton. And then, uh, after we moved this uh, to Long Island, and I didn't want to travel to Long Island, I got a job offer to run the electronic uh, specialty department at uh, RCA in Camden. Now, RCA was involved um, at that time also in the space program. Was, that, was any of the space program communications being done there in Camden? No, I was uh, in charge of... Uh, military uh, secure communication. And how was it evolving then in those days? Were they at the point of like frequency hopping, spread spectrum and things like that in those days? Yeah, all these things, all these things were discussed. Um, my team probably developed the world's first really working software-defined radio. I mean, a lot of publications were done about proposing things, but I think we had the first one that actually worked. And uh, I gave a classified uh, presentation in England, highly classified actually, uh, about uh, these things to do. And the limitation were the microprocessors and this COSMIC processor from uh, RCA. Uh, it's a computational limitation. Uh, was kind of limiting the technology and the speed, but it was a computational problem. The architecture hasn't changed much. Really? And about what year was this? Because when we think of software-defined radio, we're thinking what the late, well, we're, we're actually, we're, we're thinking not the late 90s. We're actually thinking in, in the 2000s for this, right? Well, I published a book about uh, radio communications in nine, around 1985. And this already had uh, some of the beginnings where I was allowed to publish in there. So in the, in the beginning of 1980, we already had a running radio. Really? Oh, how interesting. Yeah, well, the, the information, the thing was paid by from the American government, so uh, there's a limitation what you could publicly do. Well, I remember, I think in the, well, it must have been in the early 90s, digital signal processing was beginning to take off, uh, probably as a result of the, uh, the computer era that we were also in. Did you spend a lot of time in uh, software design radio after that? Yeah, one of the tricky things we did uh, is automatic single sideband uh, carrier tuning. So if you don't know, if you, if you find a single sideband, you never know what the exact frequency is. So we developed a method how to define the 60 hertz residual hum on a signal and tune the receiver. Yeah, we've done some uh, crazy things and also uh, invented what I would call today the composite filter. In uh, analog, you can also make a bezel filter, a Chevy chip filter, a linear phase filter, you can do all these things. But in mathematics and digital processing, you can uh, put a lookup table together with a very fast look, uh, lookup table. And so if you take a 400 uh, megahertz clock frequency, uh, you can re-clock the signal and you can composite a filter which mathematically exists because it has the components of a linear phase filter and then a Chevy chip or elliptical filter you can do filter which in reality don't exist. That's why it's called composite. You put the mathematic coefficient together as you need them. Well, that's pretty amazing. The reason why I do this is then you can avoid the ringing, the Gibbs phenomenon, the ringing uh, CW filter, which has been in the literature very often, was due to the misunderstanding that a brick square filter was the better choice. Arthur Collins did it right. He had a round filter, and this had minimum ringing. That's why the Collins filter and Collins radio sounded so much better. The engineers later came up with the kind of silly architect uh, to make a square type of uh, filter. And the uh, group delay at the ends causes rings. So that's why these brick filters, as they were called, are, are terrible. And the round filters were much better. And the ideal is a composite filter where you put the mathematics of all worlds together. That's the correct answer. But you can only do this in DSP. I saw when I was doing researching this 
episode of QSO Today that in 2015 you were awarded the prestigious I.I. Robbie Award that recognized your outstanding contributions in the areas of atomic and molecular frequency standards. This is causing me to probably go back in your background. In the background info that was in this article, it said that your fascination with oscillators um, actually started when you were a teenager. I see how all of this is going together, but can you talk about oscillators? You seem to have written the majority of the articles that you published in at least uh, QEX on oscillator and oscillator design. Can you tell us what fascinates you about them and also how they've evolved over time? Well, the first oscillator I built was kind of illegal uh, because I built a... Uh, a super regenerative receiver uh, to listen to the German police in 1952. And I used a pentode and uh, the super regenerative receiver transmitted and receives at the same time. And that's how I built my first oscillator. <laughs> it made a lot of noise. Of course, I mean, there were many super regenerative receivers in 1950 and so later in QST, but uh, that's how the whole started. Uh, but much later, I, uh, being at AEG Telefunk, I saw the impact of single side bit noise of the oscillator. I mean, it takes a while to understand that these oscillators are noisy and that they make noise in the adjacent sideband. And therefore, this, the single side bit noise of an oscillator suppresses a weak signal uh, next door, so to speak. And there's a difference whether you read these things or whether you experience them. And that's what started my interest in low phase noise oscillators. I see now that. We're now buying frequency synthesizer chips for two bucks mounted on uh, circuit boards. How have oscillators evolved in your world to this point that we're, we now have $2 chips? Yeah, that's a double-sided sword. My position is the quality of an oscillator has to do with the electric Q of a resonator. And the electric Q is more or less proportional to the volume the tuned element takes. So if the, the highest Q for an inductor is if the length of the inductor is three to five times longer than the diameter. By the time you reduce the inductor to a piece of stretched wire, the Q is essentially useless. And so the oscillators which you put on a chip have an extraordinarily low Q, and the way to rescue the situation is you take a PLL phase lock loop system, and uh, with the, within the loop band, with you clean up the noise of the oscillator. So what you see at the output is not what the oscillator does itself, but you see the cleanup mechanism of a phase lock loop. But outside the loop band, was, it's a lot of garbage. It's a big compromise, uh, and uh, it depends what you want. If you want to have the best, you have to do it discreet. If you want to have something which is fast and dirty, you do it uh, on IC. A good negative example is the GSM telephone. Initially, the base stations were supposed to use every second channel, but the phaseness wasn't good enough. So the GSM signal uses the third channel. Each channel is 200 kilohertz, so the third channel is 600 kilohertz away from the carrier. And finally, the phase noise of these oscillators, 600 kilohertz away from the carrier, was good enough to avoid the interference of the adjacent channel phase noise. So you lose in distance one channel, and you need more base stations. Now comes the economic question, what would have been cheaper, to fix the oscillator or to build more base stations? In my opinion, the economics lost, and uh, now you have more base stations and poorer radios. It went just the opposite how it should be done. Right, although I see that GSM is going away in many places and being replaced with you know, pure digital, what LTE, and uh, probably, what, 5G in the future? Yeah, if you t do a frequency time slot, things uh, that changes, but there are still enough... Uh, old cell phones available, uh, but the, the major drawback of these digital telephones is that in analog, the human brain can still put some things together. If you say something like York, and everybody knows you are in New York in the vicinity, the human brain gets the New York word back together. And the bit error uh, range, if it's beyond a certain error, it cannot recover, you lose the contact. So while you can get more channels on the digital, the signal to noise ratio quality requirements are much worse. So you get smaller distance, which you pay. Uh, you can have more stations, but you have uh, less distance. And I remember when the first tests were done in New York, uh, because of the reflections in the buildings, it didn't work very well. The analog system outsmarted the digital because of the bit error rate problem. Nobody understood this. So digital is not always the answer. Were you involved in the, in the cellular telephone industry, you know, from its infancy? Yes, with the base station, a little bit, but the base station then requirement 
became so cheap, and as I explained, then they eliminated the Channel 2 and they went to the third, 600 kilohertz away, and then the uh, CMOS oscillators as a chip were good enough for the purpose. Uh, and uh, my company, we are trying to avoid uh, CMOS oscillators. They're just too noisy. Now, you've published over 60 articles for QEX and QST over the years. Have your, has your approach to receiver design then changed, and is, it, is that based on the availability of components? Well, it, it certainly changed over the years. I mean, the fully uh, digital receiver with an analog digital converter is only feasible for the last uh, 10 years uh, to have a good performance. I mean, the initial uh, chips were not good enough to give you a few numbers. The noise figure of a analog digital converter is about 20 dB noise figure. I mean, it's useless. So you need a preamplifier. And uh, the analog digital converter is an integrator. So if you take 1 million signals at 1 microvolt next to each other, if you multiply the two, you get 1 volt. And then the analog digital converter is dead. Nothing works. In. So you have to, you need much more pre-selection and filtering. The uh, 3 dB per dB mathematics for a double balance is much more useful. The, the real advantage, in my opinion, is the numerically controlled oscillator. But uh, in as much as the receivers have vastly improved, you have enough dirty transmitters on the market and all the old transmitters which uh, have poor splatter capability are disastrous. I think the point has come to stop worrying about receivers but clean up the transmitter. Do you think that the ham radio transceivers that are being produced now uh, in the marketplace, do you think that they are outperforming the older radios, maybe with the exception of the Collins uh, uh, radios, but um, outperforming those radios for the, I'm trying to think, the bang for the buck? Uh, let's go back to the Collins. The Collins radio, because of the mechanical filters, which were very round, had the best sounding. It was not the greatest in dynamic range or uh, overload problems where they also, but on a quiet evening and not too many aggressive signals. This was the best sounding because of the shape factor the the mechanical filter had. The transmitters in, in grounded uh, grid were certainly much better than things to do today. The uh, neutralization and feedback they used on the power amplifier was up to uh, minus 46 dB below carrier distortion are unchallenged. I mean, these old tubes simply better. It went from minus 46 typically down to minus 32, which is a huge, a very huge uh, disaster. And uh, the quality of the transmitter have not uh, caught up by any means. So if you look at the quality performance, I would certainly look at the transmitters. And there's some interesting discussion, what's better, a field effect transistor, a bipolar transistor. The field effect uh, MOS transistor is a very good choice, but only lately can you get a uh, these transistors which are good enough. I think if you go back five or six years, they still weren't good enough as today. Good progress has been made, but you have to do it right. But when we're talking about these new field effect transistors, are, are we... LDMOS. They're called LDMOS. Yeah. Oh, LDMOS. Okay. When we're talking about these these components, these components, do you think they're, they're a spinoff of the proliferation of microwave devices and cell phones and everything else and are we talking then about the characteristics of microwave type transmitters now or are we are we you know down still in hf we are still down at hf uh, the ldmos uh, the way they're made uh, are not useful about above five six hundred megahertz uh the, the, the better device but for lower frequency linearity and high voltage i mean the smaller the transistor gets to for higher frequencies the lower the breakdown voltage gets. So the, the, the optimum uh, up to 50 megahertz uh, are these LDMOS. I think there's some exotic ones which can at best go to 400 megahertz, but that's the end. And these I wouldn't call microwave devices. These are very good power device optimized for this frequency range. If you go up to the microwave uh, range, uh, 10, 30, 50 gigahertz, uh, the world has changed. Total difference. Uh. So what kind of transceiver does N1UL use now, nowadays? If you're looking at, at your shack, what, what do you have? That's a loaded question. <laughs> Number <laughs> of <one>. course. <laughs> it's a loaded question. Number one, uh, <clears throat> ICOM gave me a 7850 because I helped them with some things. And that the, the, the high volume version is called 51. They gave me serial number one. And uh, so in my opinion, the, the this high end, I think 12 or $13,000 uh, dollar 
radio on the market is the absolute best. I'm sure that the people from Flex Radio and others will disagree with me, but uh, I, I think from an architectural point of view, this is the very best. It has a uh, numerically controlled uh, DDS type of oscillators of phase noise. Of this thing is unchallenged. It's just superior than anything else. And also the uh, transmitters of high quality. It uh, also uses the old concept, which means it has a input filter. It mixes up the frequency to a VHF frequency, somewhere around 50 megahertz. Then use a uh, few kilohertz uh, crystal filter. And so the analog digital converter, which follows, is protected by the 3 kilohertz bandwidth. And that still is and will be the best way to do it. Any other way by putting a wider signal to the analog to digital converter uh, has the drawback that de deteriorates the quality, but it's much cheaper because you avoid the entire front end. So if, if money is the issue, then you take an ICOM 7300 or whatever these things are. But if you want to have something which is unchallenged, then the higher price radio is the only answer. It's an, it's an architectural thing here, and uh, you just can't do any better. And uh, on the other hand, I use a uh, most for my Ham radio on shortwave, I use my own company radio, which is a military system for frequency hopping and things like this. But because of the um, frequency agility and hopping and all the things it does, it, uh, strangely enough, is not as good in some aspects as the ICOM radio. There's a contradiction. Very fast switching of frequency hopping and things like this. Uh, switching speed contradicts some of the phase noise. You can have either or and not both at the same time. That's an architecture. So um, the RNS radio with one kilowatt output uh, is my favorite. Uh, it has the least number of knobs and works very well and does everything it can do. But from a performance, if it gets crowded, I always would take the uh, ICOM radio, there's no question. And now this mid-show break. You can keep the QSO Today podcast commercial sponsor-free by becoming a listener sponsor yourself. For $10 a month or save 20% at $100 per year, you can become a listener sponsor. I'm now recording the QSO Today podcast as video interviews that are available only as a benefit to listener sponsors through our QSOTodayCommunity.com website. As I develop the sponsorship tier, I will add bonus content for listener sponsors. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo has now evolved into the QSO Today Academy. QSO Today podcast sponsors are automatically members of the QSO Today Academy and will have full access to the Academy resources under construction now. The benefit of listener sponsorship as an alternative to commercial sponsorship is that commercial sponsors influence the content and comments in the podcast. Commercial free allows a greater degree of freedom to discuss any ham radio subject without commercial consequence. I have eliminated all commercials in the QSO Today podcast from episode 445 on, with the exception of the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, as I think it is a serious asset to a well-rounded ham radio education. I'm not using Buy Me a Coffee or Patreon anymore, but my own system for managing the community that could form out of the podcast. I direct you to the sponsorship section of the show notes pages beginning with episode 444, where I list all of the contributors to the podcast since 2014, including sponsors, donors, and hams who have paid for the transcriptions. There is a new section where I list the most recent sponsors and donors over the last 30 days. This list is generated automatically from my membership system. This week's listener sponsors are... Jerry Rector, K4OAM, Matthew Hortzman, KI5PQG, and William McClatchy, KK4C. This week's new donors are John Endres, KJ7KSX for $105, George Heron, N2APB, $100, and Gregory Graham, N5GSG, $20. There were anonymous donors as well, and we appreciate their contributions without mentioning them by name. Our funding model is now value for value, where you trade with me your time, talent, or treasure that you think values the benefit of the QSO Today podcast to you. If sponsorship is not your interest, then you can make any size donation to the podcast by clicking on the donation button on the QSO Today podcast website at qsotoday.com, there is a slider that you can use to adjust the amount of your donation. If you want to make your donation monthly, click on the Recurring Donation box. 
It is the recurring donations that keep the lights burning here. I want to thank everyone who has contributed and will contribute to my effort to create this oral history of amateur radio since 2014. It will eventually all be in the public domain for hams in the future to enjoy. Be sure to become a listener sponsor or make a donation today. And now back to our QSO today. And the reason that that this feature, these uh, numerically controlled DDS, is not available in lower price radios is is that this construction technique is expensive. <clears throat> yep, yep, yeah. It's an, it's power hungry and, and uh, yeah. It's not a field radio. It, it it's a radio that sits on the on the desk. Correct. I think the AD ninety nine fourteen. If you take a look at the data sheet of the AD ninety nine fourteen and the whole series, starting from twelve to fourteen. If you look at these analog digital converters. Uh, and they are DEX uh, digital analog converters, and they generate all these frequencies. It's a complex issue. You have to have a clocking frequency, which in the gigahertz area, it has to be twice as high as the output frequency. So if you have a frequency of 50 megahertz output, then you're better off if you have a clock frequency of 250 megahertz to clock the DDS, and there are all kind of peripheral things necessary and not to have any spurious sidebands. So, but that's the right way to do it, and you can and I gave a presentation on this at the university, you can today do in pure mathematic a better signal generation than you can do in the old-fashioned analog. That's the amazing thing. The analog free-running oscillator, as we know it, is noisier than what you can do nowadays in mathematics. Now, do you think that the digital modes, the Joe Taylor digital modes, have created the ability for us to actually create cheaper, maybe poor performing receivers, but because we're able to um, recover the the data way down in the noise, that we've kind of gotten around the issue of having to have a, a really high-performance receiver? Uh, yes. Uh, you At the moment, the sunspot cycle is low. I think what we have at the moment is unrealistic, uh, plus all the propaganda stations from the various countries have shut off. So the, the overload, which we used to have in Europe, has disappeared. But the Joe Taylor method... Uh, really loses the person-to-person interference. You exchange numerically numbers. It's like one computer talking to the other. And uh, right. nothing against Joe Taylor. He's an extraordinary gifted and uh, nice gentleman. But I prefer then with all the possible interference, a regular discussion like you and I have on this telephone, which occasionally makes some funny noise. I prefer this because it's a real life. And you get all the emotions and everything comes across the telephone. That's really life. And a sterile exchange of numbers, uh, I think, is, uh, for me, not attractive. So your favorite operating mode, then, is uh, single sideband, maybe even AM? Uh, AM, AM, I call it antique modulation. takes too much bandwidth, good bytes to it. But uh, the single sideband, yes, that's my preferred modulation. And where do you hang out? Are you a contester or are you a DXer? What, what's, your, what's your favorite operating mode? My favorite operating mode is take a telephone, call some friends. Are you having time? meet on the air, and then I go on 20 meters or 18 megahertz, and then we have a roundtable discussion of various topics, but I initialize this thing by placing a telephone call and saying, is the propagation there, can we talk to each other? And my favorite bands, depending on the time of the day, between 7 megahertz, 14, and 18 megahertz, at the moment the higher frequencies are dead, but these three frequency uh, bands are ideal. Well, that's pretty cool. And you don't have to do a one ringer anymore to get people on the air. You can actually just call them up and say, um, I'm on seven, on 18 meters or something like that, right? Well, I cheat a little bit. What actually I'm doing is I take WhatsApp. Many of my friends have a WhatsApp <laughs> connection. Uh, so uh-huh. I cheat and send, I send a WhatsApp connection and say, how about? And then I give a frequency and then it, it works or not. So, But that's, that's how I do it, yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. Do you operate... Any of the UHF, VHF digital modes like DMR or FM or anything like that? Uh, I own several repeaters in Munich, uh, here in New Jersey and in Florida and the Swiss Alps, which I donated to the MS. But I don't like these endless chats with very little contents on the repeaters. They have to have a special need for these things. Sometimes I hang around with the spider net at uh, 14347. Uh, in Mark Island up here, but not that often. And, uh, yeah, I, I have uh, ability up to 1296 to single sideband. I see, all single sideband. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. I used to be pretty good at Morse code, uh, but it's too slow. I mean, it takes, before you said everything, I know. I don't have the patience. So when you do your uh, roundtable on HF, yeah. what's the topic of conversation? Similar to what you do and I do at the moment here. We talk about 
where things are coming from, where do they go, and what's needed to be invented, so to speak. You're a pioneer, and it's and you're a descendant of a pioneer and leader in RF communications, both commercially and in amateur radio. What What is the state of RF design these days, and who's doing it? I cannot answer the question in the form you've, you've asked it, because I'm not sure how you define the state of the art. I mean, <clears throat> my interest lies in generation of signals. We talked about uh, oscillators. I explained right. why oscillator noise is an issue. <clears throat> and the uh, the things which my friend uh, A.J. Potter, who I locked into a room, took the key away and said, no meal, no toilet, you have to pass the extra class license, which he did. <laughs> uh, he, he, and I, he and I work on physics, on extremely modern physics-based oscillator on what's called metamaterial structures. Uh, these, the uh, metamaterial is a material that does not exist in nature. It re- relates to a structure, and only to a structure, it's no material, a structure uh, which in an evanescence mode reflects uh, waves. And the best explanation is you have a gain bandwidth product, and uh, so if the gain bandwidth product is constant in a passive device, uh, what you do is you reduce the bandwidth and then the amplitude gets higher because the product of both remains the same. So you can get a Q multiplier or increase of ampl- uh, amplitude in a resonance system and you get uh, Qs beyond the wildest dreams and you can build oscillators at uh, low phase noise beyond the wildest dreams if you know how to invoke this evanescence mode in passive structures. And that's something we're doing successfully now and which outperforms everything has been invented before. And you're doing this at Synergy Microwave, where you're, where you're the chairman of the company? That's correct, yeah. I'd like to talk about Synergy in just a second, but I want to go back to my question. You're lecturing in universities right. now. Are you seeing in the universities people like you, like you were, you know, at the time, uh, interested in and highly motivated in the area of RF engineering and oscillators, receiver design, transmitter design. Are those people there? Are are our young people coming into this area of the uh, profession? Yes, and many are more gifted than I am, my friend. There are people who are much better in mathematics and uh, much better educated. Uh, I'm I'm on my way out, so to speak, and uh, people have now more in mathematics better tools than I've learned, and yes, I've seen people who are extraordinarily gifted, and uh, one of the things I've done is I have established a monetary fund uh, where we give money to gifted uh, students which couldn't afford a certain education things and pay for parts of the education. I think I think I deserve uh, they deserve help from people like me. That's the correct thing. Oh, I think that's amazing. You mentioned just a minute ago that um, that you're the chairman of, or maybe I mentioned it, that you're the chairman of Synergy Microwave. Uh, that's your company. It has a, an amazing online catalog of microwave components. If a ham wants to start his exploration of microwave, is Synergy Microwave a good catalog? Is that a good place to start? And, and can you recommend, if that is a good place to start, like a, a parts list of basic components that somebody could have to put together um, a microwave laboratory? Uh, yes and no, because uh, we are trying not to be a low-cost company, but we are trying to be a high-performance company. And for reason of economics, we typically have a minimum order, not so much quantity, but amount of money. If it's less than, let's say, $100, we wouldn't take the order. And this, of course, is not good for ham radio because they need one mixer, not 10. So from a technology point, uh, we can be a great help, but from a Source, we are not useful because we cannot handle financially useful small orders, but there are distributors and other companies who address the needs of individuals much better. And that's to the degree, I mean, people have asked me all the time whether I ever built a power amplifier. I said, no. First of all, it's so much mechanics and less electronics. And by the time you buy all these things in one single piece and you pay shipping cost and you assemble the whole thing, it costs more than when you buy it. And uh, so some things which are useful to build and some are not useful to build. And likewise, in, with my eyes, I couldn't uh, solder SMD devices anymore. So from our contents, yes, we have nice things, but uh, as a supplier to the ready amateurs, there's no. 
I want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast, with George, KJ6VU, and now joined by Rod, VA3ON, Mike, VA3MW, Mark, N6MTS, and Vince, VE6LK. Every two weeks, George and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests' workbenches. This group is project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building, or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. Are you involved? in uh, 5G cellular telephone development? Yes. Can you say um, how you're involved and, and what you think that's, uh, what that's going to turn out to be? The way I'm involved is that uh, our family company, Roden Schwarz in Munich, generates signal generator which you need to measure these future telephones. And uh, you have to generate artificial signals like multipass distortion and things like this, you have to be able to generate uh, signals which come close to reality and you can see how the algorithm in those radios perform and how the antennas work. So yes, we generate a whole suite of uh, signal generator and test equipment, spectrum analyzers, uh, up to about 100 gigahertz, which are used for this purpose. And it's a mixture between mathematics, firmware, software, and uh, it's driven by the complex situation. I mean, give you a typical example. Uh, if you drive around in Manhattan uh, and uh, if you want to talk handy talkie direct to another handy talkie, you most likely talk via reflection. And so if you cannot penetrate a building, it doesn't go through, and then you have a delayed signal. You can have two reflections, one from the left, one from the right. They can either kill each other or they can enhance each other or there's a phase shift and there are all kinds of things. And in these radios, in these telephones, there's something called a training. The receiver, uh, the system gets told what things are going to happen, and then they do phase adjustment. These are very complex mathematical uh, things, how you deal with the signal. And yes, to generate those frequencies up to 100 gigahertz and to do it well and do low phase noise. Yes, we're involved. And as you just revealed, you're still involved in Roden Schwartz. Are you on the board there, or are you still in management there? By definition, by definition, well, we don't have a formal board. Uh, four times a year, the owners of both families meet together and uh, we discuss what things we need to know. It's mostly an, an informal session because we have a very capable management and contrary to uh, some other companies where the heirs, which essentially I am, uh, are at war with each other. Uh, all of us are very peaceful. All the heirs of the Holden Schwarz founding people have their own jobs. They don't live off the heritage, but uh, we have our own things, so we don't need the income. That we leave the money in the company to secure the well-being of employees, and we have zero liability. We cannot be blackmailed by any bank. We have no liability in any form, money-wise, from any bank. None. Well, that's pretty amazing. We can buy the bank, but the bank cannot tell us. <laughs> you know, I think... Um Craig McCaw, who was um, you know, one of the early cellular telephone pioneers in um, Seattle, Washington, once said that w- when you owe the bank $50,000, you can't get them to return your call. But when you, when, when you owe the bank $10 million, they always return your calls. Well, my, my joke is the reason why Julius Caesar got killed was because he paid his liability to the bank. If he had been a cop, <laughs> I think he would have survived. That's, that's my equivalent take to what you just said. Yeah, I think you're probably right. You're a sailor and have a sailing yacht called the Dragonfly. You have some beautiful pictures of it online. Yeah, huh? these, are two, these are two words. One, it says dragon. Fly means take off. It's it's not the dragonfly. The insect. Oh, and it's not the dragonfly like a dragonfly. It's, it's dragonfly. Yeah, dra- dragon space fly. Take off. We won the race in Antigua twice. And the cost of one race is $50,000. And your payback is a piece of metal, uh, silver-plated with uh, your name on it, and it's just not worth it. So once you know how it works, we, I said, let's do something. It's a waste of money, and I can do more useful things for the community uh, than uh, fly 10 people to Antigua and win a race. So I've stopped doing it. Where have you been on your ship? 
Have, have you gone around the world in it? No, no, I'm too timid. I, I'm, 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 I don't get seasick, but uh, I must admit I would be too timid to go around the world. I don't think I would like this. So the most I've done is in the Caribbean and uh, down to Antigua, things like this. The nice thing about sailing is for hours nothing happens. The wind is steady and you can lean back and think the things you never had time to think about. And at the same time, I have probably the most advanced uh, ham station on the sailboat. I have two sailboats. Uh, one, one is a Benito 47 and one is a Swan 53. And I probably have the most advanced uh, ham radio shortwave station on the boat. And so it's fun to talk to people in the world and sit there and sail and think things through for which you normally have no time. This I like. You have to. Nobody can call you. You have to think, what would I like to do? How do I solve a problem? So that's a that's a, a good question. I hear this in, in a lot of podcasts when people talk about, you know, maybe personal or business success. How do you, if you're not sailing, how, how do you lock yourself away in, in order to do some deep thinking? What's your escape mechanism if it isn't your ship? I spend most weekends in reading latest scientific papers and as many people I can do multitasking which means on the surface I'm reading something of interest but then the uh, below layer of the brain works and things and takes keywords and solves puzzles and I don't have any better way of explaining this but out of certain things I do I come out with a solution it's just like a light bulb goes on and here's the answer it's a, it's a slow process it's, you cannot force it, but it has to go. It, has, it, 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 uh, it takes a certain amount of time before things get ripe, but the, certain things you cannot force have to develop. In your- and it's not related necessarily to the paper that you're reading. There are some common denominators because the individual may have a similar or related problem, and he comes up with a solution, but there are sometimes this uh, common denominators, and then you find something which fits, and then you take the advice you find there. I see. Ulrich, what kind of impact has amateur radio had on your family life? <laughs> everybody in my family and everybody who reports to me in any higher function must have a ham license. <laughs> Do you have a wife who has a ham license? Yeah. Children? Yeah. Uh-huh. All, of All of them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good for you. Even even the top manager of the Oil and Schwarz company had a ham license. Well, that's pretty cool. And, and do you actually communicate over ham radio to, to, to the people in your life? Yeah, the, the more distant one, yes. The other one, uh, I can see on a daily basis. <laughs> well, but it gives her, as a result of having the ham license, it, it gives her a, an appreciation of what you're thinking about, perhaps. Uh, it also gives people understanding what certain things mean. Mm. Uh, and uh, so if you talk about, uh, uh, yeah, let's, assume, let's take Synergy Microwave. I take care of some technicals, and my wife runs the daily operation. What this means is, She looks at our products for what's in it, what they cost, and what's possible. So the HEM license has helped her a lot to understand the costing and what a mixer is, what uh, a resistor is. You get a basic understanding. So even if your background is in economics, but now you know what we talk about. And I mean, I have a similar opinion. You cannot design a car if you don't know what torque is, if you don't know what tire is, how you get the horsepower on the street. You need a certain education and practical experience with driving a car before you can design one. And you cannot run an electric company if you don't have experience what these things mean in real life. And that's my opinion. If an attorney or a, uh, or a pure financial man runs a company, he will never have the same success as somebody who is close to the real problem. And the other opinion I have is, which is probably uh, not shared by many of your listeners, the fact that you don't that you own something does not mean you're the best one to earn it. So I'm quite happy that the 10,000 employee and two billion dollar sales uh, in sales company Orden Schwarz is not blessed by my present running it, but is blessed by me giving scientific input because there are certain people who are, who are better hard nosed and better to run a complex thing like a company better than I can, I could have done because I come from technology and not from management. These are different, different abilities, and uh, I'm, I like what I'm doing, but I'm trying not to do things I'm not good at. So uh, I find you separate what you own and what you do. They are not related. Well, I th- <laughs> you, you keep, you keep um, throwing out these pearls. I, um... <laughs> I do what? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you keep throwing out these pearls of wisdom. I, I'm sitting here thinking, uh, well, that must be my problem. I'm I'm great at the uh, at the ideas, but I'm terrible at management. That that's probably why I'm sitting here doing a podcast. Uh, I think I think you're 100 percent right. What, what excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? Well, amateur radio, and I hope I don't insult anybody. For me, is a tool to permit me to do operate on various frequencies and evaluate hardware. And it, but the thing excites me uh, most about uh, ham radio is my ability to try antennas and modern communication systems legally on the air and on frequencies. With, without this uh, ham license ticket, I wouldn't be able to do. So for me, ham radio is a powerful permit and ability to play with new things and, and kind of invent, invent these. It's like a driver's license, the permit to do something. Most of the things which... Uh, people now do already invent it. I mean, I, I have very little mercy when people argue that they lose a few megahertz at 1296. Who cares? Everything you need to know about 1296 has been invented. There's nothing new. Okay, yeah, you, t- you try propagation. But essentially, if you're honest, and most people are not, most of these experiment things are known, propagation. There's a lot of things known. But the things which are not known, People don't pay too much attention, like I said. At the moment, the transmitters are too dirty. If I had the power, I would re-engineer most uh, amplifiers and throw the old ones away and, and make sure and show if you have clean signals. But that's politically not correct what I'm after. So for me, ham radio is a, is a legal playground to test things to myself legally. Wow. Make sense? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think you're right on. For those of us who grew up in, in ham radio... Yeah, it's an amazing playground. I think that, that, you know, some of us may underestimate, you know, its value. What advice would you give to new returning hams to the hobby then? Well, I would give them the same advice, which is valid for me. Uh, over the weekend, occasionally, I go on 20 meters and point uh, west and see who I like to meet in Italy or Spain or somebody and uh, talk to people and get an opinion which doesn't follow the local news and I can exchange ideas. For me, it's an human interchange permit to talk about uh, things of common interest and uh, people are much higher educated than many years ago and have more opinion. I find it fascinating to learn and understand opinions, why people think the way they do, what things they don't like and, and how to get uh, orderly uh, system. And I mean, the funny thing is in, in, when I was in school, the ham radio did two things for me. It improved my English, which was at the time, of course, questionable. And it helped me in geom- geometry. Uh, no, not so uh, See, my English just failed. Which, which uh, city is where and uh, how things fit together. I mean, all of a sudden... So I it pro- improved your geography. Geography, yeah, that's where well, I'm starting, you see. And my English is far from perfect. So I learned all of a sudden which, where certain places are and what the distance were. Now I have a much better view and at the time, 1956, I mean, I knew Italy and Sweden and some things, but what did I know about the Far Eastern thing? And uh, I remember I talked to King Faisal, I talked to a lot of uh, uh, highly powerful people in the world. Uh, they all don't live anymore. But this interconnect and the ability to exchange ideas, the guys just said, call me Faisal. Didn't say King, they just called me Faisal, and we talked about antennas and what he liked and he didn't like. It was a nice, open conversation, and the ability to talk to other people under no pressure at their leisure in a relaxing way uh, have, has a higher value than some of these high-pressure news on television. Well, Ulrich, it's been a, a wonderful pleasure to, to uh, speak with you on the QSO Today podcast. I've learned a lot, and I'm going to go back over my notes and just try to figure out exactly how much I've learned. It was really a pleasure to uh, to speak with you, and I want to wish you 73, and thank you so much for coming on the QSO Today podcast. Yeah, likewise, and uh, you asked all the right questions, at least from my opinion. I don't think you forgot anything which is of any relevance, and I thank you for your patience. Thank you again so much. 73. Yeah, likewise. Bye-bye. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Ulrich. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put an N1UL in the search box at the top of the page. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the episodes into written text, please contact me. 
Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing on the subscribe buttons on the show notes page. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages. Your value for value support is recognized on the QSO Today podcast and in the weekly show notes. Use our Amazon link when you shop on Amazon. Clicking on this link before you enter Amazon will allow Amazon to pay us a small commission on what you purchase. This is a very painless way to support the QSO Today podcast. QSO Today is syndicated on every podcast platform, including Spotify and the iTunes Store. Until next time, this is Eric Fors at 1UG73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.